Good evening. I want to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order at seven o'clock on January the 21st, 2020. I certainly want to welcome everyone here. We're so glad to see you. And I also welcome those folks who are watching our meeting at home as well. Glad to have you. I'm going to first ask if you will please join me in a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. And now I'm going to call on Council Member Charlie Reese to lead us in the pledge, and I believe we have some friends to help. We do, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, and good evening, uh, Mayor and colleagues and um, Red Durham residents. We do have uh, two scout troops tonight. Uh, troop 451 and 456 are here. They're going to get the microphone and then lead us in the pledge in the front. So if it's your practice to do so, and if you're able, please rise as we uh, say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, and to the Republic for liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good job, Scouts, and thank you. And can I ask, um, it looks like that the Scouts in this troop are both young men and young women, is that correct? Great, and so this. scouting has changed, and I'm glad to see uh, all of you all here tonight. We appreciate you being with us and leading us in the pledge, and thank you, Council Member Reese. Madam Clerk, uh, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shul. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Council Member Austin. Here. Council Member Caballero. Here. Council Member Freeman. Present. Council Member Middleton. Here. Council Member Reese. Here. Thank you. And we'll now proceed to the ceremonial items. <clears throat> the first ceremonial item we have is always one of our favorites. It's the neighbor spotlight. And I'm going to ask Natalie Spring and members of her family and friends if they would like to come on up. Everybody that's clapping for her, <laughs> come on up. Friends of Natalie and family of Natalie, please come forward. Come on up, Natalie. Everybody, come on up here. this out. This is the Neighbor Spotlight Award for Natalie Spring, an incredibly deserving member of our community. Natalie Spring is the recipient of the Neighbor Spotlight for the month of January 2020. The Neighbor Spotlight Award recognizes community members that have gone above and beyond in volunteering their time to serve our community. This month, Natalie Spring, resident of Cleveland Holloway Community, was nominated and selected because of the wonderful work that she has done in, our, in her neighborhood, including, but not limited to, organizing the neighborhood annual Halloween event, Kid Holiday About Kids, organizing numerous neighborhood cleanups at Oakwood Park with routine cleanup days with community members and volunteers, organizing a network of community members that comes together regularly to ensure the safety of elderly neighbors living throughout the community and encouraging all citizens of Durham to become valued assets within their prospective community by keeping hope alive. I wanna congratulate Natalie on being the January 2020 Neighbor Spotlight for the City of Durham and thank you for all the work you do to improve the Durham community. And I just want to uh, Congratulate you, Natalie, and appreciate you and present you with this Neighborhood Neighbor Spotlight Award and ask you to say a few words.
<laughs> so I was looking for my neighbor, Dina, who nominated me, which is why I'm here. Dina is one of my partners in crime, as is, uh, this is my family. I'm, I will say that with all that's happening at McDougal Terrace right now, I feel a little weird being up here. And I can't wait for the time when Ashley is up here in this space and me being in the audience clapping uproariously for her because she's doing real work in our community right now. And I think a lot of other stuff pales in comparison. But thank you. Good job. Want to get a picture? Come on, everybody. Okay. Let's get in here. Let's get all that in. Come on, you. Mommy. You be in? No. Thank you. <laughs> Say again? Okay. You could your ear. Oh, okay. Let's, let's act friendly. All right, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Congratulations. And Natalie, thank you for your words about Ashley. I am thrilled to say that Ashley was well honored this weekend and will be further, but she got a wonderful award last night uh, at the Martin Luther King Steering Committee and I uh, appreciate your words as well, Natalie. All righty, our second uh, presentation is gonna be Sister Cities Durham. Uh, and we're gonna, I'm gonna ask Brady Searles and others to come up. This is regarding the trip to Tiloran, Costa Rica. And I'm gonna ask uh, Council Member Caballero and Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, if they would please join me as well, because they'll be uh, going on this trip. So um, I'm going to uh, just ask Brady if he will introduce the members of the delegation uh, and talk about the purpose of this trip. Brady, can you do that? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Shul and City Council members. It is exciting for Sister Cities of Durham to be organized for another delegation to go visit one of our new sister cities, Tilleron, Costa Rica, signed the mayors. The mayor signed that partnership last April. It's exciting to have our delegation partly represented here. On my left is my wife, Carolyn Searles, who's a member of almost all of our sister cities committees. Uh, Elba Prego, who is the chair, co-chair of our Tilleron committee. Tom Coughlin back here is a member of that Tilleron City Committee here. Uh, Randy Griffin is the co-chair of the Kavala Committee. Oh, we're going. And it's particularly exciting to know that we have two members of City Council going with us. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Jillian Johnson and Councilperson Javier Cabrero. Two years ago, we had a major delegation that went to Kavala, Greece. It's exciting to know that we have a delegation going this time in both cases, hosted by the mayors of those cities. We'll have the opportunity to meet with their local committee to talk about projects and partnerships that benefit both the city of Durham here and their city. We'll be meeting with the uh, Chamber of Commerce and Tourism to develop projects and possibilities. And we'll also be meeting with their city council members, have dinner with them, and we'll actually recreate the signing ceremony that we had here in Durham. So as he signed with that, I'll let Ilva Prego comment briefly since she's from that area and initiated our contact. Hola, uh, I'm very excited. It's a, it's a great historical moment for Tilaran, our new sister city with Duran. It's the first sister city with United States, and I believe for Duran is our first with Latino America. So I'm very proud being Latino and being in this community and how much we are growing and all the support that we have for our mayor and the community of Duran. And we have, a, it's a great moment to get to know the people in Tilaran, uh, get to know our new sister city with Latin America and bring different opportunity for everyone who wanna come and visit us. Thank you, good night. <laughs> Um, thanks, everyone. I'm really looking forward to this trip. It'll be my first Sister Cities delegation, um, though we have welcomed several delegations here in Durham and always enjoyed meeting those folks. Um, I think the Sister Cities program is really an important part of our civic culture here in Durham. 
with so many um, tensions and issues in the world, I think it's really important that we get to know people in other countries and other places on a on a human level. And we have sister cities all over the world and have hosted delegations from folks um, from countries all over the world and have gotten the opportunity to learn more about their cultures, get to know them as individuals and build the kind of connections on a municipal level that are unfortunately um, so often lacking from national governments. So I'm really excited about the program and the opportunity to visit Tilleran and meet some of their elected officials, learn about their government and um, just have a great experience. So thank you all for making it possible and for Sister Cities for doing this important work in our community. Thanks. It is exciting to think in terms of building relationships with our sister cities internationally, but also to be aware of the fact that it helps us build relationships with our international neighbors who live in our neighborhoods right here in Durham as we become more and more an international community. Thank you, Mayor Shewell. Thank you, Brady. Thank you. Thank you, Brady. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, nice so serious. All right, and now we're going to have the proclamation for Fred Karamatsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution, and I'm going to call on Councilmember Charlie Reese, who I see is already up here, and uh, he will do the honors and welcome our guests. Charlie? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, appreciate this opportunity uh, to proclaim January 30th, Fred Karamatsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution here in Durham. Also want to thank Dr. Tracy Sataki from the Japan America Society of North Carolina for being here tonight to accept this proclamation and to say a few words afterwards. Before I read the proclamation, I'd like to take this opportunity to speak a little bit about why this proclamation is so important. This is an especially appropriate time in our nation's history and in our political life to honor the life of Fred Korematsu. 78 years ago next month, during a time of geopolitical uncertainty abroad and nationals paranoia here at home, the President of the United States signed an executive order that required the forcible separation of people based on their nationality and the nationality of their families. Even American citizens, like Fred Korematsu, were caught up in the sweep of this illegal and unconstitutional executive order, an order that was sold to the American people by our government as necessary to protect our national security. Eventually, a federal judge found that executive order to have been unlawful. And even though Japanese internment is now almost universally recognized as one of modern America's darkest episodes, these types of xenophobic and racist appeals are still being made by our so-called leaders in Washington, D.C. And we've even heard them just this past year here in the city of Durham. Tonight, we reject those voices. In recent years, Durham has opened our hearts and our neighborhoods to thousands of refugees and immigrants, and nothing exemplifies our city's values more than our eagerness and happiness to welcome these new Durham residents into our gracious and loving city. And finally, this proclamation is important to me on a very personal level. My mother was just three months old when she and my grandmother immigrated to the United States from Japan. As the son and grandson of Japanese immigrants and as a first generation American, today's proclamation is deeply personal to me as is the courage exemplified by its honoree, Fred Korematsu. So again, Mr. Mayor, thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to proclaim January 30th, Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution. And I'll read the proclamation and afterwards, Dr. Sataki will say a few words. <clears throat> Whereas Fred Korematsu, the son of Japanese immigrants, was born on January 30th, 1919 in Oakland, California. And whereas on December 7th, 1941, Japan attacked the American military base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, propelling the United States into World War II. And whereas during World War II, Mr. Korematsu refused to comply with Federal Executive Order 9066 signed by U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt on February 19th, 1942, which authorized on the basis of supposed wartime military necessity, the relocation and internment of 117,000 people of Japanese descent, two thirds of whom were native born American citizens. And whereas after being jailed in California and subsequently sent to the Topaz War Relocation Center in Utah, Mr. Korematsu unsuccessfully challenged the relocation order in the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and the US Supreme Court. And whereas President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, issuing an, an apology and payment of compensation to individuals of Japanese descent who were interned during World War II. And on Jap January 15th, 1998, President Clinton awarded Mr. Korematsu the Presidential Medal of Freedom, America's highest civilian honor. And whereas until his death in 2005, Fred Korematsu remained a tireless advocate for the constitutional rights 
of Americans to liberty, due process, and equality without regard to race, religion, ethnicity, or, natural or national origin. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim January 30th, 2020, as Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution here in Durham, and hereby urge all residents to con contemplate the life of Fred Korematsu and the critical importance of preserving civil liberties, even in times of real or perceived crisis, and to take special note of this observance. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this 21st day of January, 2020. Thank you. Now we'll have Dr. Dr. Tracy Tsutaki from the Japan America Society of North Carolina. Thank you, Mayor, Councilman Reitz. Good evening, my name is Tracy Tsutaki, and I am the co-founder and chairman emeritus for the Japan America Society of North Carolina whose mission is to build ongoing positive relationships between Japan and our state. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, and um, I want to let you know that we've had a great relationship also with our organization and the city of Durham in working with the sister cities um, and the uh, city of Toyama, Japan as well. But today, it's an important day where we're going to be recognizing Fred Korematsu in this proclamation and I thought it was most important and most valuable to share this day with my daughter, Amanda, who's a fourth generation Japanese American, born here in North Carolina. And there's nothing better than to share the civil liberties and the importance of it with her. So I'd like to turn things over to her to share a few words. All right, good evening. Good evening. Hope you all are well. Um, my dad was raised in California by my grandparents, who were also born in California. At the height of wartime hysteria, after the Pearl Harbor attack on February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which deemed Japanese Americans a threat. Immediately, my grandparents and their parents were sent to an internment camp during World War II, along with approximately 120,000 others, primarily living, living on the West Coast, based only off their Japanese ancestry. Fred Korematsu is remembered for fighting for his civil liberties and refusing to go to internment camps. He took his case all the way to the Supreme Court, only to have his protection under the Constitution rejected. It was not until the Congress passed the Civil Liberties Atta Act of 1988, where the incarceration of Japanese Americans was deemed unjustified and unconstitutional. Absor ob observing Fred Korematsu Day has emphasized the importance of remembering one of the most blatant forms of racial profiling in U.S. history, the incarceration of Japanese Americans. It also allows us to reflect upon the present day civil, civil rights discriminations such as mass incarceration, anti-immigrant sentiment, and Islamophobia. Thank you to the city of Durham for recognizing Fred Korematsu Day and the civil liberties for all. On the behalf of Japanese American Society of North Carolina, it's an honor to accept this proclamation. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Reese, and thank you to all of our folks who were here for the ceremonial items. Uh, we will now have announcements by members of the council. Uh, I'm going to start with one announcement. I know there are uh, several people here uh, who are interested in uh, making comments uh, regarding the situation at McDougal Terrace. Um, that is uh, not uh, on our agenda, wasn't on our agenda last week either, two weeks ago, but we had about 50 speakers then to talk about that. So what I'm going to do is, after the meeting is over, it won't be a long meeting, uh, I'll be happy to meet with uh, anyone uh, here to do that, and we will meet uh, directly after the meeting. Uh, so we'll, everyone will have their chance to have that discussion, uh, any of the tenants of McDougal Terrace, any of the residents. All righty, any other announcements by members of the council? Council Member Middleton. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much. Good evening, and good evening to all of you in the chamber. I, I always look forward. Uh, to the Fred Korematsu uh, proclamation because it always is, is in such close proximity to our celebration of Dr. King's life. Um, and to me, they're just powerful reminders of the ongoing conversation uh, we have in this country uh, to make it a more perfect union. We will never be finished with that experiment 
uh, but it is an ongoing conversation, and, and that proclamation for me is centering each year. So I want to thank my colleague, uh, Councillor Reese, for his diligence in, in bringing that to us uh, each year. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, celebration in Durham this past weekend of the life and legacy of Reverend Dr. King. And uh, last night, uh, Mr. Mayor, you delivered some really powerful words to uh, the evening service uh, held in Durham at Mount Calvary, uh, United Church of Christ uh, here in Durham. And I thought you did a wonderful job in keeping us centered uh, on what's important. Uh, it's a matter of record that Dr. King was supposed to be in Durham uh, the day he was assassinated. Uh, but he was with uh, workers, striking workers in Memphis uh, folk who, who were being violently threatened uh, for simply asserting their rights. So it, it seems almost poetic that on the weekend of Dr. King's um, um, holiday that we celebrated that we convene tonight still um, facing uh, a major challenge here in our city. Uh, I do want to say, because a number of people, uh, and I hope I'm in order, Mr. Mayor, um, have contacted me, and I, I called Anthony Scott directly. There were some residents who were concerned because they got notices that they would be checking out or their stay would be up at the end of this week. And I just want to be very clear, and, and this is on um, word from the director, that uh, the authority is, is renewing stays on a week-by-week -week basis. So if somebody told you they were leaving, you were leaving the end of this week, according to the director, that's not the case. They're just letting you know uh, that the week uh, that they contracted for is up, but that they are going to be extended. According to Mr. Scott, um, it's going to be at least another couple weeks. Uh, and I want to just take this opportunity um, to reiterate um, and just to remind us of an assurance that I asked for Mr. Scott for and that I'm governing myself um, by, and that is um, we will not allow anyone to go back uh, into conditions that are unsafe, that have been painted over, that have been rushed jobs. And what that means for the future, I do not know. Uh, but we have crossed a threshold that we cannot come back from. Uh, we simply cannot allow folks uh, into conditions that are, are life-threatening. Um, we got that assurance from, from Mr. Scott, and he's governing himself according to that assurance. Um, and I'm certainly, I just want to reiterate my uh, stance on that and my expectation that, that DHA will govern themselves according to that. Um, I hope also, I know we're waiting for a price tag, Mr. Mayor, and I, I hope that in the meantime, um, it will be uh, taken into uh, taken seriously that I don't think that any detail is too minute or insignificant and that this council would be kept abreast on everything uh, that's going on uh, from inspections down to the comfort of our residents and folks staying in hotels. There is no detail for me that is too minute or too insignificant for us to know about. So I, I, I just want to say publicly on record uh, in this in your hearing in this chamber and those of you watching at home that that um, we plan to stay uh, kept abreast and engaged. With that said, uh, before the folks were uh, displaced from McDougal Terrace, um, they were talking to us about a lot of things. And I know that this issue has rightly, rightly commanded our attention uh, here in Durham, but there are still some other issues. And we've had some gunfire uh, and some gunfire incidents as well uh, in the last couple of days in Durham. And I want to send a concern and regard and condolences out to those that have been affected uh, by gunfire. We've got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time uh, in the city. And the conditions, when those folk go back home, there will still be some conditions outside of their apartments and outside of their homes that are still pressing issues. So I just want to let folk know that have sent messages to me that, that while this is a pressing issue and it, it uh, has captured our attention, uh, we still uh, will focus on the other quality of life issues that affect many of the same people that are displaced every day. Uh, when there are no headlines or no cameras following them around. Uh, so with that, Mr. Mayor, um, in the spirit of Dr. King and in the spirit of Fred Korematsu, the, the conversation continues. Uh, the work continues to make Durham, um, to continue to make Durham uh, a more perfect city, if I can gloss uh, on the term, uh, a more perfect union. I wanna thank you for your continued insistence, Mr. Mayor, that we will not let this go. Um, and I thank you for your leadership on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, council member. Are there any other announcements? Councilmember Freeman. Yes, thank you. I also would like to um, align myself with the comments of Councilmember Middleton around those conditions that are inside and outside of folks' homes and recognizing um, there's also a shared economic prosperity question that still raises up for me. I recognize that um, this last 
Wednesday, we had the chance to have a conversation about reparations in the community. Um, and I would really like to implore our folks in the community to start to think about what that might look like and to really start to put pressure on our state, um, our state and federal government to start to look at the study around that. I will be pushing really forcefully this next year and having that conversation so that we're actually moving forward, recognizing that for Frank Kamamatsu and many other Japanese Americans, actual reparations were actually put in place to address that issue. And it was not the case for many African American descendants of slaves. And I want to impress upon how much of that has to do with the situation that sits at McDougal Terrace and recognizing that there are folks there who live in public housing and they would not have had to had not the government set that up. Recognizing all of these things, I know that the conversations are a part of this, and it doesn't mean that things will happen fast or quickly. But I also want to implore us to, as a city to be thinking about what it looks like to be supportive of those residents who've been in those uh, hotels and hotel rooms with young children for multiple weeks now. And it breaks my heart to think that they can't run around. Um, I know the Parks and Rec is probably at the ready, but I don't know how much of that has been coordinated to make sure that there's shuttle services to activities or if there's activities happening on site or whether or not there's shuttle services to local parks or what have you. But I know that um, there's a way that we can be supportive without necessarily spending the upfront money on the repairs only, but having a conversation so that we know what residents in the, in the hotels actually need because it shouldn't be the case where someone feels like, you know, they don't want to live this life any longer and want to take their own life because they're, they're hurting and they're, this is not from, this is not just one instance. It's a long, it's a long standing, it's a long standing issue and the way that we treat people in this community is important. And so we know that the families in the, in the city, the, the residents who are in this situation, who have, no, who have no stove and are forced to use a microwave at that to serve their families for this last few weeks. And I do mean few weeks. I would not have lasted more than five days. I know I had to stay in a hotel for a few months with that lead abatement that I mentioned previously, and I know how hard it was. I was, I was pregnant with twins at the time, and I had a young three-year-old. I will say that I, I understand more than folks, under, folks think, and I, I know that we will attend to it. Um, aside from that, I just wanna make sure that we're, we're letting folks know in the community that we're still here and we're still with you. Thank you. Councilman. Thank you. Thank you, Council. We'll, we'll, we'll sit down and talk about it after the meeting. Council. Council member, thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other, any other comments by members of the council? Any other announcements? Any priority, any priority items by the city manager? Sir, sir, please. I'm happy to talk to you after the meeting. Okay, will you? Okay, you need to maintain order. Thank you. Are there any priority items by the city manager? We're going to turn this off. Unmasking the secret landlords buying up U.S. property. Are there any priority items by the city manager? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. No priority items. Madam Attorney, any Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. The city attorney's office has no priority items. Madam Clerk. 
No items, Mayor. Madam Clerk. Uh, we have no items. Thank you very much. We're now going to go through the consent agenda. The consent agenda is made up of items that the council has previously considered and can be approved by a single vote of the council. Items can be pulled from the consent agenda by members of the public or members of the council, and if so, will be held until after the meeting is over. The rest of the meeting is over for consideration. Item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, human relations commission appointments. Item three, expedited hearing request for 505 West Chapel Hill Street, PID 114577. Item four, participatory budgeting accessibility ramps project. Item five, agreement with Durham County for the provision of housing assistance to related supportive services under the housing opportunities for persons with AIDS, HOPWA program. Item six, contract with housing for New Hope Inc. for rapid rehousing and street outreach services. Item seven, second amendment to housing for New Hope Inc. rapid rehousing contract 2019. Item eight, interlocal software usage agreement for sharetherightnc.org. Item nine, service contract with Cone Inc. to service, monitor, and maintain the new elevator equipment within police headquarters. Item 10, proposed conveyance of property located at 20404 Lincoln Street to Arthur Trice. Item 11, universal release of NCR 41, NCR 52, and NCR 54, restrictive covenants reversions. Item 12, interlocal agreement with the Durham Housing Authority to procure security cameras and lighting. Item 13, design build services amendment with LaChase Construction Services, LLC, for the City Hall HVAC and Electrical Renovations Project. Item 14, contract ST303 Pavement Preservation Project 2020. You, you have heard the consent agenda, and I'm now going to ask uh, for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 7 0. Thank you. We'll now move to. We'll now move to item 17 under the general business agenda public hearings. Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment Outdoor Lighting TC 1900002. Mr. Young, welcome. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Pat Young with the planning department. Um, first, I can certify for the record that uh, this public hearing item has been advertised in accordance with requirements of law, and there is an affidavit uh, to that effect on file with the planning department. And I'll now turn it over to uh, senior planner Carl Kalasna of our staff, who will provide a brief staff report on this item. Mm -hmm. Carl, hang on a second, please. Keith, could you see those doors close? I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Young. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, this is a text amendment TC 19. Could you introduce yourself? Oh, yes. Sorry. Uh, my name is Carl Kalasna. I'm a senior planner with the Durham City County Planning Department. Uh, this is my first time here. Um, this is a, thank you. Uh, text amendment, this is a TC 19-00002, is a privately initiated request to amend Unified Development Ordinance, paragraph 7.4.2b.2, outdoor lighting applicability. So under the current ordinance, outdoor lighting that is used exclusively for recreational activities is at least 100 feet from residential uses and is not illuminated during late hours, is exempt from the lighting standards set in place by section 7.4 of the UDO. This amendment, were it approved, would allow lighting that operates during late hours to maintain its exemption from the standards of 7.4, provided that a minor special use permit is issued. Per the proposed text amendment, Review criteria for the minor special use permit relate to lighting, which include glare, traffic safety, economic effect, and compatibility with adjacent property. 
those items would have to be adequately addressed in the minor special use permit hearing. In addition to the minor special use permit hearing, lighting that is illuminated during late hours would still have to be an exclusively recreational use and would be at least 100 feet from residential uses to maintain its exemption from section 7.4. Finally, with the approval of a minor special use permit, the expansion of the allowable hours of illumination would be capped at 5 a.m. for Friday and Saturday nights and 3 a.m. for Sunday through Thursday. And this expansion of hours of illumination would only be available to development on parcels in the industrial, industrial light, and industrial park zoning districts. Um, uh, attachment C includes the proposed ordinance language here, and staff's available for any comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've heard the report from staff, and I'm not now declare this public hearing open. I'm going to first ask: Are there questions for members of the staff by members of the by the for the staff by members of the council? Okay, um, I have a couple uh, ones that I had sent uh, previously and appreciated getting the uh, answers in writing, but I thought would be good for folks to hear. Um, can you talk about the, uh, it, it's my understanding that the, the what we have with us uh, to, is, is changed from what was at the Planning Commission because it restricts the, the time of the hours of the light, the, where the lighting is available. Yes. And it also restricts, and it also restricts the lighting to uh, just industrial zones, is that correct? That is correct. And that's a change that you've made pursuant to the Planning Commissioner's comments. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. What about the recommendation that the distance between this lighting and residential property be 300 feet rather than 100 feet? So staff believes that a site-specific evaluation is the best avenue for that sort of analysis, in which case that would be the minor special use permit, which on a case-by-case -case basis would uh, analyze and have evidence presented in, in an evidentiary manner um, as to a specific mitigation of lighting on the property and any adjacent property. Um, that said, uh, council may at its discretion direct um, the amendment to the proposed UDO to recommend a 300 rather than a 100 foot um, distance. And that's something that we've talked to the applicants with as well. The 100 foot distance then is not the, the, the minor, if, if, if the applicant came before the Board of Adjustment for a minor special use mm -hmm. permit, the 100 foot would not be um, the least that they could require. The, is that true or not? So what the 100 foot uh, requirement is, it's, it's basically a condition for the applicant to be allowed to be exempted from some of the sections of the lighting ordinance. So if we look at the specific language, um, let me see here. So outdoor lighting in the applicability section of the ordinance, it says outdoor lighting used exclusively for recreational activities, concerts, plays, or other things that are open to the public, provided that the light fixtures are located at least 100 feet from any adjacent residential use and the event meets other requirements. Uh, sites or developments that meet those specifications are allowed under the ordinance to apply for an exemption that would remove the requirements for lighting. Um, expanding that to 300 feet, it, it essentially means that no matter what, if your development has light fixtures that with, are within or closer than 100 feet to uh, the distance between the residential use and the light fixture, if that's the case, then you cannot apply for this exemption, and that would still be the case with this approved. I get, I get that. I understand. But my point, my question is, if, if the, can the Board of Adjustments say no, 100 feet's not enough, it must be 300 feet if they want to? Um, they wouldn't even apply. Yes, they can. So you're saying that handling this on a case-by-case -case basis in front of the Board of Adjustments so that the board can be sensitive to the needs of the local property owners is preferable. Yes, exactly. Okay. And the notification issues raised by Commissioner Miller, can you discuss that as well? Yes, sure. 
So, the, um, in accordance with state regulation, the text amendment was advertised via a published posting. Um, in addition to that, and in, in excess of the state regulations, uh, Durham has a system of electronic notification where any resident who is interested in uh, being aware of any text amendments or zoning changes can sign up for that. So the, this application was submitted in accordance with the state regulations. In addition, um, staff feels that the requirements for the minor special use permit require notification for adjacent property owners on a case-by-case -case basis. So in a situation where someone who may be potentially impacted by development, they would be notified via this system. There would also be sign postings on the property of the uh, of the property that, that was applying for the minor special use permit. Um, beyond that, advertising on the general text amendment um, would, requ would have required an, a specific posting or specific mailing to, to every property owner in the county, which uh, staff didn't see the, the utility of that in necessarily, so. Thank you, I'm satisfied with all those, with all those answers and appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for staff at this time? All righty, hearing none, is there anyone uh, who would like to speak on this item? Please you make a way over here and uh, give us your name and address. Uh, Keith Burns, I'm a long-term resident of Durham at uh, Acorn Ridge Court and, and a 451 alumni. <laughs> uh, I'm an attorney here on behalf of the applicant tonight. I just underscore a couple of things that staff has said, and then I know you probably all are interested, if you don't know already, what's really behind this. And, and while that may not be entirely germane, I want to satisfy that curiosity for you. Uh, Todd Waldo is with me and will speak to that issue. So the things that I would underscore are, this is not a request for lighting at any location. This is a request to extend by three hours during the weekdays and four hours on the weekends if and only if a special use permit is granted. So we're asking for a text amendment that allows us the opportunity to ask and to prove that lighting for those three additional hours or four additional hours would be appropriate given the circumstances of any particular property. So I, I, my point here is just to be very clear that this is, in my mind at least, a narrow uh, and tailored request. And beyond that, as staff noted, one that only impacts the, uh, the industrial zones, industrial light uh, and IP and, and industrial. Uh, with that, the thing that's driving this is the ability to operate a top golf facility. Uh, the property that we're specifically talking about sits at the intersection of Page Road and I-40 uh, in an IP zone in an area that uh, does not have residents anywhere around it at all. Again, that's a matter for the special use permit and not anything that I'm asking anyone here to, to really consider tonight, but just for context of where it is. And for a little bit of context around Top Golf and why it is that they need this additional uh, time for lighting, I'd invite uh, Todd Waldo to come up. And as Todd's waking, making his way up, if anyone has questions for me, I'm happy to try to address those. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Waldo. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. Uh, good to be with you tonight. Uh, Todd Waldo, Top Golf, 8750 North Central Expressway, Dallas, Texas. Uh, we're hopeful of your support tonight uh, to advance this project a little bit further along. Uh, we're very excited about the opportunity about bringing the first Top Golf to Durham, North Carolina. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the text amendment, the language in the text amendment regarding lighting. And I'd just like to give everybody for the benefit of setting the context of, of what is being proposed here. Uh, we are partnering with a developer, developer out of Greenville, South Carolina, Realty Link. Uh, they have developed five or more of our properties um, and we are undertaking with them in partnership to develop a 46 acre uh, piece of land in South Durham at uh, uh, Page Road and I-40. Uh, this is a development that will bring, uh, you know, a mixed use development with uh, office, uh, hotel, entertainment users that will help complement the Research Triangle Park. Um, it is uh, uh, an opportunity to strengthen the city's tax base uh, and create jobs. 
uh, upwards of 1,200 jobs in total uh, as part of the overall development. Uh, associated with Top Golf, uh, we're anticipating creating upwards of 450 to 500 jobs. Um, it's an exciting opportunity for us, um, and we uh, uh, excited about hopefully being part of the community uh, in in uh, in Durham uh, and looking for for support uh, in order to uh, continue down the path for for approvals. I would like to compliment staff and helping us navigate through the process. Um, it has been a pleasure working with, with everyone, very professional, um, and also sharing a little bit of the background regarding Topgolf itself. Um, so some folks may not be familiar with Topgolf. Uh, we are a uh, premium golf entertainment use with a best-in-class business operation. We have 58 venues worldwide. Um, we are... Um, we are in a growth trajectory now of adding seven to ten venues per year, um, and we have um, strategically um, determined that, that Durham, in particular, is a great opportunity for us to bring this type of world-class entertainment experience to uh, the residents of, of Durham. A uh, little bit about the economic impact of Top Golf only. Uh, we're making a multi-million dollar investment in the city upwards of 25 to $30 million as part of this construction project. We will create up to 270 jobs during construction alone, 450 to 500 uh, once the venue is open and operating. Uh, we have an economic impact uh, over the 10-year period of roughly $250 million. Uh, we have a direct fiscal impact over a 10-year period upwards of $30 million. Mr. Mayor, point of order, if I might, sir. I noticed the clock is not running, and I'm, I certainly... Uh, uh, appreciate the virtues of Top Golf, but I'm wondering if this is germane to the issue before us. And I noticed the clock is not running either. So. Yeah, I, I, that's my fault. I didn't give a time, but yeah. take another minute and that'll be good. Certainly, certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Yeah, just trying to give everybody the benefit of the overall context, though, but we are. Uh, context is lighting. All right. Yep. Yep, we are a uh, good corporate citizen looking to be a long-term uh, partner in the community uh, and hopeful for your, for your vote tonight to, uh, to move this thing forward. So appreciate everybody's support and any questions, be happy to answer those. Thank you. All righty, a few gentlemen after you, uh, before you leave tonight, could put your name and address on a yellow card over there. That would be great. Sure. All right, any questions for the applicant? Any questions for staff? Any further comments by members of the council? I just, council member? I was just gonna ask for clarity. I know that you were trying to make sure that we were understanding that there had been a change from the planning commission meeting to this meeting. I just wanted to clarify that that was to change it to 300 feet. The change, no, the changes, there was no change in the, um, the distance, the change, there's a still a minimum of 100 feet, but when the minor special use permit, this is, I'm gonna state this, and Mr. Young, you can tell me if I'm right, but the minor special use permit, when it comes up, can require it be as much as 300 feet or more. Okay. Yeah. And this is, this text amendment is specific to this location only? No, it, it would be applicable in any um, industrial zoning district, IL, IP, or I. Okay. So it would be the applicant site, but then the, about 3,000 other sites across the parcels across the county. All right. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Council Member. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to thank um, Planning Director for replying to a very late in the game email. Uh, thank you, Pat, for doing that. Um, and I also want to thank staff for taking seriously the concerns raised by the Planning Commissioners. Um, the proposal, the request that's before us tonight is, um, I think, much improved uh, from the version that they recommended in a nine to four vote, <clears throat> and I intend to support tonight. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if there are no more comments, I'm gonna close the... You know, I would make one more comment to just note that I, I think the, the semblance of what the Planning Commission was getting at is summed up in our Planning Commission Planning Commissioner Nate Baker's comments and recognizing that it's, it's interesting that we use this 
mechanism to address the issue on a case-by-case -case basis through a whole text amendment. And so I just want to note that that's still an issue for me, but I will um, support this moving forward. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, uh, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter's back before the council. Uh, the first motion we will need is to adopt the consistency statement. So I'll move to adopt. Second. We moved and second that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you. The second motion will be to adopt, adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. Move to uh, accept. Second. Second. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Council members, I'm gonna reverse my previous decision. I thought that a meeting afterwards would be suitable to have a good discussion with folks, but apparently they don't think so. So I'm going to uh, ask Mr. Chadwell, if you don't mind, and ask folks if they would like to come in and we will be hearing them. Thank you. Scouts, thank you for being here. <clears throat> if everyone could please take a seat, that'd be great. Now we can get going. Well, I thought that I would uh, meet with folks afterward and that we'd be able to have a good discussion. Clearly, that's not enough for people to be satisfied, so let's hear from everybody. What I'm going to do is this. I'm going to limit everybody to two minutes, and what I'm going to ask you to do is anyone that would like to speak. I already have several names. I'm going to start with them, and anyone else would like to speak. Uh, I'm going to ask you to fill out one of the yellow cards that's over here. Uh, I got the people that are on this sheet I've got. I'm gonna, excuse me one second. I'm not going to have anybody yelling out in this meeting. I'm happy to hear from people. I really am. I want to hear from people. But everybody has got to maintain a semblance of order. Thank you. I have the names of five people who've signed up. And for those people who would also like to sign up, if you'll please go over to the clerk's table, she can have you sign a sheet or a yellow card, either one that's uh, up to the clerk. Okay. All right, I want to ask the first five people that please come over to my right. We'll start with Chris Tiffany, then we'll have Ashley Kennedy, uh, then Velvet Harris, Lysanda Ormond, and Laura Betty. If you all could please come over here to my right, and you'll each have two minutes. Mr. Tiffany, welcome. Our point's supposed to be on. Mr. Tiffany, you have two minutes. When I first moved here 30 years ago, I lived in Parkview and there was raw sewage leaking inside and out and in Cornwallis too, bad plumbing. And when I lived in Lincoln Apartments, sewage leaks there too. And when somebody asked me to help look after his wife and kids when they were sick, sewage dripped on my head when someone flushed the toilet upstairs. Other kids were sick too and some parents worked at nursing homes and the VA 
and some work at restaurants and grocery stores, and one little kid was delirious with a fever of 105. I called Duke to speak to a pediatrician asking, how can we get her fever down? Do you have insurance? No. Don't bring her here. Click. She hung up without answering my question about a very sick kid, one of many in the neighborhood and the schools. Complaints to that landlord were useless, and when I went to the health department, they sent somebody with a stick to clear a clogged storm sewer grate outside the bedroom of a kid with asthma who died in the night so the three-foot deep pool of raw sewage could drain into the creek. I complained to data about no ventilation, no running water, soap or paper, feces piled high in one, one toilet with no toilet seat. I spent a weekend in jail and there was feces on the wall between bed and toilet and no toilet paper in any of the cells. At least Martin Luther King had toilet paper to write on. I complained to the county commissioners about Duke and Health Department and the jail. Sheriff Andrews denied all such complaints, and Chairman Michael Page said, we have to believe the sheriff, and it's not a hotel. <clears throat> the Health Department told Andrews about inspectors' visits so they could hand out bleach and mops and rags and toilet paper before, to clean up before each inspection. There's E. coli in Durham's surface waters. Even if you do not care about poor people, think about that when you brush your teeth. Public health hazards affect you. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy, welcome. You have two minutes. Durham, I'm disappointed. I'm hurt. I'm pissed off. And I'm not going to apologize for my behavior. Enough is enough. Y'all, y'all don't understand. Enough is enough. We have babies that are tired of eating the same thing every week. We have babies going into cardiac arrest from eating so much sodium. We have older people being transported by paramedics because they're tired of eating the same thing. They can't keep eating it. While everybody else in Durham is at home eating good, we have residents still stuck in hotels eating the same thing every day. Stove's not working. But guess what? DHA got money for these brand new trucks. They just bought every employee new cell phones. Didn't they just give Anthony Scott a raise? Yeah. But Durham is woke, right? Durham is woke, right? If this don't hurt y'all, I don't know what else is. I'm so tired. I can't, I just, I'm gonna come out of my pocket and feed my babies myself because my babies are not gonna eat macaroni and cheese cups another week, not on my watch. And if I have to disrupt every city function, every county function, I want all the smoke. I want it. Because if they disrupt our lives, we're about to disrupt theirs. That's right, and it's sad we had to go outside and raise hell in order to speak. Enough is enough. Durham, tell them, enough is enough. And we're fed up. And we're what? Tired. We're what? Tired. I can't hear y'all. Let them know we're what? Tired. Thank you. Ms. Harris, welcome. You have two minutes. I don't know. I just want answers. It just seems like things is being prolonged. And you ask yourself, how long do you think someone can stay in a hotel? I mean, first we was in a, a ticking time bomb gas chamber. Now we didn't move to a jail cell. I mean, I don't understand. I go over to Matt Duke every day. I don't see nothing they've done. Talk about it, man. Talk about it. Right. I can put my foot. <laughs> I walk in and the towels on the floor. My feet will go through the floor. I have holes in my walls, mold. How could you say you're going to fix something and you're not even ready to fix the foundation, the sewer? How could you go in and paint over anything? How could you use but someone else's bleach that they paid for? <laughs> you know, it's just, you, they say they helping, but it seems like it's getting worse. They give you a voucher 
and they feel like you, they made it better. It's not about the voucher because I have a job. It's not about that. We're not getting any answers at all. We're going week to week with, we might switch it to electrical. We might keep it this way. We're not getting no definite of, we're going to have a roof over our children's heads. That's what matters. It's not about the damn toiletries. <laughs> we was doing that way before this even happened. It's about what do I tell my child when I leave this meeting? Mm. Do I tell them we're going to have somewhere to go? Or do I tell them we're just going to stick this out and see what they come up with? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Ms. Ormond. Ladies Ms. and Ms. gentlemen. Oh. You're next, Ms. Betty. Ms. Ormond, welcome. You also have two minutes. I stopped by my apartment today. They finally got someone in there taking down the ceiling. However, the guy said he asked them had they or were they going to fix the pipes for my bathroom? Because if I go in there and turn my tub on or if my um, toilet flood, it's going to go right back through the ceiling. They told him they already fixed the pipes. They're lying. They have not done anything in there. I told him they lied to you. He said, I can do this job, but if it's going to happen again, it's going to come right back through. So it's going to be the same problem all over again. What's the point in fixing a ceiling from water going through it if they're not going to fix the problem that's causing that problem. If I got to live like that and keep trying to run down there and unplug a microwave or crop by, or making sure nothing is plugged up where water is going to come from my bathroom to my kitchen, I don't want to live there. They need to figure something out because I don't want my children there. I'm tired of being in one hotel room with three children that's used to having their own room. And like they said, they're trying to give us the cards just to shut us up the car is not going to shut us up. Yeah, thank you, because I'm spending more than what I usually spend. But like I told them, I spend my money in theirs. I work six days a week. I'm a full-time stylist. I take care of my children, and I'm close enough to market rent. So no, it's not about how much you pay, but the fact that I'm paying that much, I deserve better than that. My kids keep thinking we're going home. Then to hear that we have more weeks to be in a hotel, I'm tired of it. My kids are tired of it. They're sitting in front of a screen where the doctor's telling them that not that much screen time. What are they supposed to do besides sit in front of an Xbox or a laptop or a tablet? They can't run around the hotel because if so, they, we're going to get put out. I mean, and I'm, I don't want to just send them here and send them there. I like to keep my own mind. So they need to figure out something and figure it out fast because I'm tired of being in a hotel with three small kids. Thank you. Ms. Betty, welcome. You also have two minutes. Um, we have an emergency situation on our hands. We desperately need mental health counseling. This is an incredibly stressful situation. People don't know where they're coming or going. They don't know what their next step, their next place will be. They don't know if there will be a next place uh, that affects the children. Uh, cooped up in one room with, with nowhere to go, really. We try, at least in my hotel, we do try to entertain them, to do arts and crafts, to offer homework help um, on a consistent basis, but we need mental health help. Tempers are frayed, please, it's an emergency. And not once a week but two, three, four times a week. It's really urgent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Betty, what hotel are you at? Millennium. What hotel are you at? Millennium. Millennium. Thank you. I'm now going to call uh, on these speakers, and if you all will please come over to my right, Tiffany Green, Larry Hunter, Jacqueline Wagstaff, Michael Metzler, and Brittany Bass, in that order. So Ms. Green, Ms. Griffin, I'm sorry, uh, 
Welcome. Please give us your name and address, and you have two minutes. My name is Tiffany Griffin, and I live in Durham. I'm not giving my address. Um, I am a psychologist, and I'm a local business owner. And in two days, I went on Instagram and got over 55 signatures of local businesses in Durham who are standing in solidarity with those who are affected by this crisis. We are committed as a business community to helping. I tried sending an email. It bounced four times from every email account that I own. I hand delivered the letter to you guys on the 13th. I took pictures and posted them on Facebook to prove that I hand delivered the letter and I have not heard anything back. So I and the business community, 55 signatures here are committed to working in partnership to devise a plan. People deserve human dignity. People deserve a plan, not more talking, but an actual holistic plan. And then in my last few minutes or seconds or whatever I have left, I just want to say to you guys in these affected communities, McDougal and the other communities, we are with you. I am a psychologist before my degrees, before my jobs, before owning a business, I was from the gutter. Both of my parents are crackheads. I relied on the charity of many people throughout my whole entire life. Don't lose hope. You guys are stronger than everybody else in here. You will make it. And I really, really, really hope that this city treats you with dignity and comes up with a plan, not promises, not generic statements, but something tangible and palpable. And that's not staying in a hotel in another week. Ms. Griffin, thank you. thank you. I did receive your letter and I will be responding. Thank you. Mr. Hunter. Hi, I'm Larry Hunter and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a disabled person. I have spine problems. Uh, ever since this has been going on, I went, I've been going in and out my apartment and when it rained, it's water standing right by the side of where my bedroom is, by the window. There's mold down the, in other words, the footing down by at the bottom of the, of the window, it's black. I know that, and, and I know they've been paying over. One, I went over there one Monday, they was hooking white pipe to one of the sewer lines in building 23, I'm in 25, they hooking new pipe into old pipe. That's not fixing the problem. That's not fixing the problem because whatever's up in that old pipe is going to come down in that new pipe. I have, when I come out of high school, I work construction. The commercial building downtown, I help build that from ground up. So when you come and th think you're tacking stuff up, I'm watching you. You can't fool me. You can't fool me. I know about construction. I know about nursing. I've worked 17 years in nursing. And, and these people are hurting. I'm hurting. It doesn't make sense we have to live like that. When they put MacDougall on TV, I was pure shame. I said I paid all of this money to live in a hut, it doesn't make sense. You all, and then they lie to you. They continue to lie to you. You can't get no answer. We don't know where we're going. We don't know where we're going. All of these kids over there, I'm over there. I mean, that's where I originally live. This, this doesn't make sense. Somebody need to do something now. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Ms. Wagstaff. Always Welcome. You have two minutes. Always a pleasure. I can't do that. Mr. Mayor running it. Um, Mr. Mayor, this is a travesty, and you know it is. And I, I'm not going to harp on what we, all of these residents have said. I go every day to at least five hotels. I'm sitting down with these residents you see here and more every day, running interference, helping out the housing authority. They don't pay me, and I'm so glad they don't, because I can say what I want to say. But this is horrible to go in these hotels and have to explain to these folks the lies that are being told to them. Oh, it's going to be another week, kicking that can down the road, knowing it ain't going nowhere. And they want, they just want to know, where are they going to be? Can't they go back home? Miss Laurel House is right across from 51B. 
I haven't seen a maintenance man in there, and she's supposed to go back on Friday. How? How is she supposed to do that? Jillian, I've been to more meetings than you at the board meeting. How in the thought? You sat at a press conference and said, they told me, maybe if you show up, they wouldn't have to tell you. Maybe you would hear it and you would have some input. And I have to stick with you because they send you to report to them. And you're not reporting to them. This does not make any sense. But none of y'all are going to those hotels, listening to these mothers, watching these children be cooped up in a, I don't know how big the room is, but it's not big enough. They can't go in the hall. I get a list every day from the five hotels I go to to tell me about the things that I need to tell the guests not to do, not to do in the hotel. I have to go knock on the doors, talk to them. I talk to y'all every day, every day. I'm doing the job, but Mr. Our CEO just got $15,000 and a $3,000 bonus and a $550 car allowance. Who putting gas in my car? I drive it every day until the wheels fall off to make sure these residents get what they need. And I haven't seen one of you drive your car to one hotel and put one thing in their hand. Those little, like you said, those little per diem don't mean nothing. They need their homes. And y'all need to get right. So we're going to recall them. Thank you, Ms. Wagstaff. Ms. Ms. Metzler. Ms. Metzler, welcome. Thank you. You have two minutes. I'm Michelle Metzler. I'm new to the Durham area. I'm just trying to understand the politics here. I'm a PA student at Duke. Um, we're in one of our classes. We're learning population health issues and health disparities, along with uh, housing disparities, and we're having to learn a lot of information that we should be prevented up front, um, which is really sad to me. We shouldn't have to learn about babies going into cardiac arrest because they're malnourished. That's terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, I'm flabbergasted uh, that there wasn't on the schedule tonight a, a time set aside for the community to speak, and it wasn't until people had to, but until their voices had to be heard to come in. So I don't, I don't understand why it wasn't on the agenda. I don't understand. I came from Austin, Texas, why someone was here from Dallas talking about Top Golf. Maybe that was on the schedule. He can probably fly, afford to fly back in. And I, I understand there's logistics, but it, it floors me that this was not on the schedule tonight. Um, also, uh, Steve Jewell, I heard you speak yesterday and I appreciate the apology. It seemed long overdue during the march. Um, I found it strange that that you stated that there's we've known for 40 years that there's been these housing disparities and then you went on to say you think they're doing a great job. Um, I, that's not a good job if carbon monoxide poisoning, it took that to actually realize that there's an issue that, or address the issue that you realize is existed. Um, I, think, I think that's, I'm just standing here in solidarity. There's a lot of people within the med program, within my, I have a colleague here, a peer of mine that's here from the PA program. We're all very busy, um, and, but we, we support you. And we are working and talking about health disparities and we want to change the inequity. Thank you. Um, next, we have Brittany Bass. Ms. Bass, welcome. You have two minutes. And the last speaker will be uh, Azaria Lunsford. I'm from Durham, born and raised. I remember the rebuilding of the factories, the tobacco factories. My grandma worked at the tobacco factories. They redid the library. You guys redid the courthouse. You guys invested money into the parks and recreation. Um, that to basically to bring tourism and money to the city of Durham. What about housing? This is not just public housing. This is a Durham issue. It's actually Durham against the city. The water pipes that we have in all districts. Why do you think we when we go vote? It's a district thing. It's a zone thing. They put um, they put certain people in certain districts. It's even been proven that. The water quality in a low-income neighborhood is not the same quality water that's in a middle-class or upper-class area. That was on Boys in the Hood. I mean, we all watch TV. We all into power and all these different TV shows and things that's on. 
Turn off the TV, guys. Turn off the TV. Turn off the phones. Social media is a good thing if we're using it to organize. It's time to organize. It's, time, it's, it's not time to be peaceful. It's time to actually hit them where it hurts, which is all of these tourism places, all these places downtown, these bars, they coming in, they opening up. They done moved so many people out the city to the point where we don't even feel comfortable walking downtown. I don't even feel comfortable walking around in my own city, somewhere where my, my, my grandmother and my grandfather was born and raised. I mean, it's a problem. And like I said, housing is what we're here to talk about. It's people that are paying $900 a month for rent, and they living in mold. They just got new appliances. They got new furniture. They got good paint jobs. The landscape is pretty, and they still living in the same conditions we living in. So this is not just public housing. This is Durham as a whole. Y'all living in gated communities where you have to come and talk to, to get in, it's, it's, time, it's time to actually stop being nice, guys. We got to actually do it. Thank you, Ms. Bass. Ms. Lonsford. Ms. Lonsford, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Azaria Lunsford, and um, I actually had an issue where I had a gas leak. Um, the news crew came in, and they um, left my home. And not too long afterwards, they actually got sick. I am still living in that same apartment with my four children. And I just want you guys to know that we are hurting. And it doesn't seem like anybody cares besides the people that is living in these conditions. Um, we, we ask you guys for things. They don't get done. We follow the rules. Nothing helps, and it's, it's hurtful because you guys can go home at night. You guys can take vacation time whenever things don't go right in you guys' life, but we can't. We have to sit and stay in our toxic environment, and not because we made it that way, but because things were not done that should have been handled a long time ago. But I just want y'all to know that we are not alone. And these things are going on to us because we are the chosen of the most high. We are going through this because we have the most high. He is our God and he's gonna see us through this. Y'all don't have to sit here and be quiet on the things that's going on in your neighborhoods, in you guys' house. No, raise hell because that's where I'm at with it. I am raising hell, and I'm raising hell for Thalia Cobb, Anania Davis, Alea Williams, and Sincere McDonald. You guys will remember us. You guys will take care of the things that you guys have swept under the rug for so long. And that's my piece. Thank you. All righty. Council members, you've heard the speakers. Anybody have any comments? Any comments from members of the council? Comments? All right, I'll make a few. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. I, I was hoping that we could talk afterwards, but I could clearly see that wasn't working, so I was glad to be able to hear your comments. So, um, as, as Council Member Middleton said earlier, we know that this is not gonna end tomorrow. The Housing Authority is working through the apartments having their inspectors go to try to figure out each apartment what needs to happen. And that's, that's gonna take some time, it's not done yet. Um, and the reason that people don't know when they can go back is because the housing authority hasn't been able to figure that out yet. They're working with the city's inspector inspections department so that they can find out when that time is for each of the apartments. And once that is known, uh, everyone will be told. But the reason that you're living in this uncertainty is because they don't know yet. And I can really appreciate that you, that this uncertainty is really difficult to live with. I understand that. And I, I really feel for each of you all who are in that situation. It's a terrible situation. Um, we also know that once people are back in their apartments, that we're going to have to do, continue to do this work. 
and we will continue to do this work. We do have funds that we'll be able to support the housing authority with to make this housing decent and livable. And we also know that in the long run, McDougal Terrace, which is 66 years old, can't continue to be patched up forever and will have to come down. But it's gonna take a while for that to happen and to be able for, it, for us to be able to replace it. But, but, in the, but in the meantime, and folks are right, it's not just McDougal. It's not just McDougal Terrace, you're absolutely right. There are other Durham public housing communities which are in the same situation. As you all know, the Housing Authority in the last year has renovated Daymar Court and Maureen Road and Laurel Oaks. And, and JJ Henderson, JJ Henderson will be next year. So all of us, all of us in Durham, all of us in Durham have banded together to pass this housing bond and to get the money together so that we can make these changes. $60 million in the affordable housing bond are to go towards the redevelopment of Durham Housing Authority communities, and that's freed up $7 million in the Housing Authority budget for McDougal Terrace. So we are committed to this now and for the long term. I appreciate you all being here, and I am very, understanding of the difficulties that you're in, and I know that all of us are. And appreciate your patience, and appreciate your, your sense of urgency as well. All right, any other comments by members of the council? All right, if not, I'm gonna declare this meeting adjourned at 821.